January 28, 1998. Under blue skies and light winds, some of the biggest waves ever recorded hit the Hawaiian Islands and set the stage for surfing history. For the few people who make it their destiny to find and ride the biggest waves possible, it was the perfect storm. But authorities would declare it illegal for anyone to enter the waters. Everyone's gonna die that goes out there. It was just completely unsurfable. Still, some were determined to test the awesome powers of the ocean. It was a day nature, technology, and sport came together. And a few surfers explored the boundaries of their fear and craving for adventure. In January of 1998, the National Weather Service announced that a storm off the coast of Japan was headed directly for Hawaii and would produce some of the largest waves ever recorded. The weather reports indicated that the approaching waves may be big enough to take out roads and destroy homes all along the north shores of the Hawaiian Islands. The National Weather Service posts a high surf advisory when the waves are expected to be 10 feet or larger on the north shore. Whereas when they get really big, like 25 feet, we call that condition black. And in that case, the civil defense uh, calls the alert and they actually go out to the North Shore, to the North Shores. They close roads, they have sirens, they alert people, they tell them to get to high ground. They uh, basically save a lot of lives. Condition. Here are the 8 p.m. Hawaii buoy reports. Large surf always pounds the North Shores of Hawaii during the winter months but no one had ever dreamed of surfing waves as big as those said to be on the way to Hawaii on January 28, 1998. We get very, very intense storm, winter storm systems um, in the Western Pacific that produce unusually large swell. So Hawaii is, is uh, uniquely positioned to get very large waves. It's the uh, island group that's furthest away from any major landmass. Uh, on, on the planet. Essentially, it is the action of the uh, atmosphere wind on the ocean that produces the wave. There are three factors that are important. One is the wind speed, naturally. The stronger the wind, the, the greater the potential for large waves. The second is the fetch, or the distance over which the wind is blowing, producing the waves. And the third is the duration that the wind is blowing over this area. Swells are recorded and reported daily by the National Weather Service. Richard Grigg is one of the world's most respected oceanographers and a professor at the University of Hawaii. He is also one of the great surfers of the 20th century. His big wave riding is the stuff of legend. What determines the shape of the wave is the shape of the bottom. If the bottom is gradual, the wave will come in and spill or crumble off the top. Whereas if the bottom is abrupt, you have a shelf, the wave will come in, it hit that shelf, the energy is suddenly and abruptly concentrated upward. It becomes very steep and very unstable all at once and it throws out in a plunging manner and you have a top to bottom breaking curl. And that, of course, is the ultimate for a surfer because that's where you want to be, in the curl. As far as monitoring the waves, we have a buoy system in the Hawaiian Islands. In fact, there are four buoys, one north of Kauai and then three on the southern shores about 200 miles out. These buoys record the motion of the ocean. As the swell goes, swells go by, they're, they're lifted up and then they fall in between the crests and the troughs. Now that data is radioed and also sent by satellite back to the National Weather Service. These reports provide general information to the public about daily ocean conditions. They also alert island residents to extreme weather phenomena such as tidal waves and tsunamis. Surfers rely on this data to predict upcoming swells. 1998 was a year like no other for surf. 
With El Nino in full swing, the Northern Hemisphere was brewing up some of the biggest storms of the century. But no one was prepared for the weather data that came in on January 27th. It was so unbelievable that many thought it was a mistake. A massive storm off the coast of Japan that generated monster waves that were destined to hit Hawaii the next morning. The storm itself would pass within 1,500 nautical miles of Hawaii. The swells generated would travel across the open oceans until they reached the north shores of the islands, where ultimately they would release their energy. Ironically, the weather forecast was calling for clear skies and light winds. It was Hawaii's perfect storm. This is known as one of the two largest swell events we've ever had in Hawaii. That is ever meaning the last century over which records have been kept. We had a storm with winds of 65 knots blowing for 36 hours over a thousand mile fetch directly at us. The buoy showed a, a period of 25 seconds and wave heights over the open ocean of 28 feet. Now the National Weather Service, through a formula that they've developed with the data, calculated that the waves at the beach would be 44 feet. Wave heights of 44 feet would produce wave faces in excess of 80 feet, the height of a 10-story building. In 1969, massive waves of 40 feet or even higher took out beaches, roads, and homes all along the North Shore. There was concern that this storm could produce even bigger waves than in 1969. State civil defense crews spent the night and early morning warning motorists of hazardous road conditions as high surf washed onto Kamehameha Highway. No one knew how large the surf was until first light. Thousands of spectators lined the beaches, roads, and shoreline around Waiamea Bay in anticipation of the Eddie Aikau contest. Surfers. Waiamea is an absolute death cauldron once it goes over 25 feet there. And this was 35 to 40 foot surf. You had all the best big wave riders in the world sitting there going, I don't think so, man. I don't think so. It was crazy. When a wave stands up all at once and breaks along a long stretch, it is said to have closed out. Every three minutes, there was a 35, 40 foot closeout set. And I just looked at it and, and I just thought, these guys are kidding. How can they even be thinking of holding this thing? You know, like everyone's gonna die that goes out there. It was just completely unsurfable. There's so much water pushing into a small bay like that, and uh, even even rescue attempts can't uh, can't help you. So you're, you're taking your life in your own hands. Finally, after four hours of staring at waves that were impossible to paddle out to, the contest was called off. A rarity at Waimea Bay today. Waves too big for the biggest big wave surf contest in the country that has surf's biggest first place payday. But not everyone on the beach was willing to give up the day. A handful of surfers had already hatched their own plan to get out there with their jet skis and access these monster waves. But the extreme film crew launched their helicopter to take pictures of a rare and beautiful sight, with slim hopes that someone, anyone, might make it out to the one spot that was surfable, an outer reef half a mile out in 50-foot deep waters at a break called Log Cabins. At Log Cabins, the shelf out there is quite steep, but it's deep. There's a break around 50 feet that drops to 60 feet, uh, about a 10-foot shelf. And that's what actually 
triggers the wave to break. Now when it's 25 feet, it's not going to break out there. It's too small. And so it goes right over that shelf and it goes up a little bit and then doesn't break and comes in. How, however, when the surf is like 40, 45 feet, it hits that shelf, goes top to bottom and breaks. In all, 12 people made it through the treacherous breakwaters to the open ocean that day. What they saw once they got there was beyond comprehension. Mammoth swells as wide as football fields, with tubes big enough to fit a house. It was absolutely the most amazing sight I've ever seen in surfing. The waves looked as big as, like, 10-story buildings. And there, ready and waiting, was the extreme film crew in their helicopter. Now the only question was, were the waves too big to ride? The waves looked um, kind of otherworldly. You couldn't really tell how big they were. And then when people started dropping in, Everyone's mouth just dropped. I mean, we were aghast. But to see these tiny figures on these mountains, um, it, it never happened before. Cole has been living and surfing on the North Shore of Oahu since 1958 and has witnessed much of surfing history. I was witnessing the most fantastic display of surfing and maneuvering in big waves I've ever seen in my life. And these guys are doing all these turns on these giant waves. You don't even think about big wave riding. It doesn't look dangerous at all. It looked like they were just having fun. Successfully towing into a handful of perfect waves, Ross Clark Jones and Tony Ray found themselves in the worst situation imaginable. They were chased down, running for their lives from a monster wave that was moving faster than they were. I towed Ross onto the wave and it looked like we're in the perfect spot, but the wave just kept building and getting bigger, and all of a sudden I realized that the wave was actually sucking me back into it. My, my equipment wasn't fast enough. It's a very unpleasant thing being mowed over by, you know, 40 feet of white water. I just remember looking behind me and just seeing this huge wall of white water. I realized it was gonna get me, but I was still trying to get out of the situation. I was like, head down and just go as fast as I can. The biggest danger was, was the ski hitting me. That's a 500 pound piece of fiberglass and metal that's gonna hit you in the head and could kill you in a second. I had a few seconds to try and get a full lung full of air. I got that lung full of air and I was still riding in this, just enveloped in this white screen of foam and uh, I was actually riding for a little while, I had time to release that breath and get another breath. I did it a third time and then finally eventually smashed me and threw me around like quite violently. I was hanging onto the ski, the wave blasted me and I, I hung on as tight as I could and it just disappeared. It was like it evaporated from under me. I didn't know where it was and I was flying through the air for it seemed like 20 seconds before I landed back in the ocean and got pummeled by the wave. I was waiting for Tony to pop up, and he hadn't popped up anywhere, which was, was quite frightening. I was frightened for his life. 
know, a few seconds later, he popped out and he was actually further out than I was. And uh, yeah, it was an experience. The worst place to be is at the point where a pitching wave hits the surface of the bottom of the wave. That is the place where the full force of the wave explodes on itself. No one came closer to that place on January 28th than Noah Johnson. The shape of the wave was really good, really hollow, and it looked like it was going to be exactly what I'd been after, you know? It ended up being so big that my board wasn't making enough, enough headway down and across the wave, and I just was, was doing everything I could to get my line going where I needed to go, and I just wasn't getting there. When you fall in or around the lip, uh, it's, it can be dangerous. So I turned down the wave, started trying to get away from the lip. I didn't want to land on me. And I ended up timing it just about as good as I possibly could have because the thing hit the back of my board and my back foot. It wasn't quite close enough to me that it knocked me down. I ended up being able to ride out the initial explosion. The thing ended up just plowing into me, mowed me off my board, and it just sent me spinning. I went on that washing machine cycle. And it was going to be the worst wipeout I'd ever had to deal with. I stopped spinning and tumbling and the water calmed down and my partner Aaron was right there. He's right there to pick me up. North Shore local Aaron Lambert was one of the lucky ones who made it out that day. He was the only one who was actually able to get inside one of these massive barrels and ride out of it. Troy Alotus experienced the worst wipeout of the day. There was a wave that came in that uh, I was looking for out there. Got towed into the wave and I was making some ass turns down the face of it and I was thinking I'm gonna get deep in this barrel. And as I came off the bottom and saw the wave crest and bowl over me, I was standing in this barrel that was so huge and massive, I was, I was shocked. And I thought, I'm gonna just try to pull through this thing and see if I can penetrate through that. You know, hopefully the curtain's not too thick. And when I hit the curtain, it was all over with. My board broke right in half underneath my feet. I ended up in water that was so black, I couldn't see which way was up or down. And I knew that there's gonna be a wave behind it sooner or later, and I just started making strokes towards the surface. And when I got to the surface, I was, looking at the shoreline of the, the North Shore and I saw the mountain range above uh, Pupakea Mountains and I thought that was the next wave. Turned around and looked and there was another one coming down on me right then. Luckily I got a good couple breaths of air and then I got beat again and got pushed in a little further. Took about 20 more in the head right in a row there. And then I know Jay came and got me and I went back out. A milestone in the history of surfing was set when Dan Moore towed Ken Bradshaw into the biggest wave of the day. What many say is the biggest wave ever ridden. Dropping him in and, and following out on the shoulder, looking back and seeing the wave uh, behind him. He didn't see it. He didn't see what I saw. But it was the, it was the biggest, uh, you know, you could have fit two houses into this tube.
if it happens to be true, and it seems to be holding true um, under scrutiny of all of our peers and my peers, uh, that I have ridden the largest wave ever ridden by a human. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat.